with that shit? Good, it's fine. I know it's your work. Assalamu alaikum, ladies and gentlemen. How are you today? We have something new today and very spectacular project here done by uh, this phenomenal man. And uh, yeah, it's Street of the World. And I think some of you already heard about this. It's a giant book. He took photographs from 195 different countries. And uh, it is a big achievement for a photographer, and I think everyone here would, get, would, would be inspired by what he did. I wish you a very nice uh, and interesting lecture. Here, ladies and gentlemen, you won Swalps. <laughs> <laughs> it was a cold, gray, winter afternoon, and snow was starting to fall from the sky. And I walked to the shed, and I took out my sledge, and at the back of the garden at the gate, my best friend, Stephanie, was waiting for me. And I walked up to her and I said, Stephanie, you and I are going on a new adventure. We are going to find a mysterious city called Paris. And we started walking, and I started pulling Stephanie on the sledge through the snow. And it got darker and darker, and after a while, Stephanie said to me, listen, Jeroen, it's getting dark, I have to go home. So I had to decide if I would return home with her, or if I would continue by myself. And I chose to continue by myself. Unfortunately, not much later, I was uh, picked up by the police, and they dropped me off in front of my house, where my mother was waiting for me in the doorway. And she ran up to me, shook me, and said, you will never do that again. Which is not so strange, because this was in 1979, when I was only five years old. Sorry. Wrong. Of the photos in the project has been manipulated in any way. The world gevangen in 200 photos. Op deze manier kijken wat hoe dus een hele bijzonder verhaal het is. Explorer presenteert een uniek tijdsportret. Mensen die totaal anders zijn dan je dacht, maar ook veel meer zijn zoals je zelf bent. Streets of the World. Zondag 22 mei. National Geographic Channel. Five years old. So I was already uh, a little bit of, uh, of an explorer back then, and I kept exploring for a long time. And uh, I chose to become a photojournalist, and uh, I started working for newspapers and magazines in, in Holland, which is where I'm from. Uh, and I, I noticed that a lot of stories in the media, uh, also worldwide, are focusing on uh, negative stories, you know? And Obviously, there is a lot of bad stuff going on in the world, but if you only focus on those stories, the rest of us, you know, we all start thinking like that everything is wrong with the world. And although we have really big challenges, there's also a lot of good things happening. Also, lately, uh, a lot of politics are focusing on uh, dividing people, uh, which I think only will lead to disaster in the end. So I thought it was a, a good idea to try to uh, create a photo project which was about what binds us as a species on Earth, the things that we share, the things that connect us as human beings. So I came up with a concept for the Streets of the World project. And for the project, I wanted to photograph humanity in a, in a positive way. But how do you photograph humanity? I mean, it's, it's way too big a subject, right? So I tried to make it a little bit smaller, and I tried to, uh, or I decided to photograph street life daily street life in all the capitals of the world. So I agree, it's still a pretty ambitious project, but uh, I thought it could be done. I thought it could be done in five years, but it took me uh, seven years in the end, traveling to 195 capitals. 
to photograph all these cities. And what I was looking for uh, to photograph in these cities were, uh, were themes that you can find everywhere uh, with people in the world. So very basic themes like friendship and love and laughter and people working together. Uh, people laughing, you know, people playing sports, like that kind of stuff happens everywhere and it kind of shows us that we share a lot of things as well. Also in the more difficult countries I tried to photograph, I mean, not the wars itself or themselves, but uh, I think in, in countries where there are wars, these are also the places where people are able to rise above themselves. I mean, this also happens in those places and I think it's very important that we share those stories. So in those countries I started looking for uh, things like hope and brotherhood and people helping each other. So a very specific choice to focus on the, the best things that we have as human beings around the world. Also because I think in the end, if we want to face the challenges that we have today you know, as humanity, I really, I am now, I am totally convinced that it will only happen if we try this together instead of uh, remain divided. So that's basically the, the, the concept for Streets of the World. But of course, uh, I also had to come up with a technique. You know, I'm sure a lot of you are photographers yourself. And uh, when you decide to tell a story, whichever story it is, you have to, you have to think about uh, how am I going to photograph it? Is it going to be black and white? Is it portraits? Is it, you, know, you have to make some choices, especially with a project like this. So I, I started thinking about the technique. And I, I also, it's about connection. So I wanted to photograph it technically as well. Um, in a way that would connect all the photos together. So all the photos I took technically in exactly the same way. I always used the same um, uh, uh, angle, so the same lens, basically, a uh, 60 millimeter lens. I always used the same uh, point of view, you know, because you could go like this or this or this. I was always looking straight ahead in all these streets and also the same depth of field. So in my photos, basically everything is in focus. And if you keep doing that from photo one till photo 195, which is what I did, uh, it results in a series of photos which has the horizon at exactly the same height in each photo. So throughout the whole project, the horizon is basically connecting all these different photos and all these stories to, to one another. Also results in exactly the same amount of sky, which is a sky that we all live under, you know, that we share and that we also have to protect together. So the stories, themes in the stories are about connection, but also the technical approach is about connection. For today's lecture, I, I've chosen to tell you a bit more about uh, the way it really works taking photos for this project, because I thought you would like that. Um, of course, it's a project uh, about traveling as well and adventure. So I want to take you on a trip around the world, small trip, I think about seven countries of the 195 that I photographed. Um, let me see um, some hands. Who heard of the country Tuvalu? There's one. You don't count. There's one person over there. Imagine, you know, maybe like 80 people here now. So it's a very unknown country, but it is a sovereign state. It's in the middle of the Pacific. And I had to go there for the project, which wasn't uh, a punishment at all. This is before I start. This is a small or a quick map of all the countries I visited. It's 10 seconds, but it took me seven years. A bit frustrating to see. So because this is a lecture, I wanted to read something to you from the book I wrote about this project, about daily life in Tuvalu. When the sun peels at the end of the tropical day, the population awakens from its daily hibernation. Slowly but surely, you hear them stir. First come the children's voices. The kids are eager to cross the grassy verges on either side of the landing strip and, being there and begin their daily ball game. There are, of course, various groups based on age. Before long, the strip has become a gymnasium floor crowded with kicked and thrown balls. As the sky's color deepens to orange, the grown-ups arrive. Teams are picked, and they start playing their local variety of cricket. The grass beside the asphalt is ideal for this purpose. A little further along, a group of boys is doing a warming up for rugby practice and running tactical drills, followed 
by a rough and tumble scrimmage on the asphalt. Here and there, a rocketing ball scares off a dog or knocks a child from his bike, which results in much wailing. Women in colorful outfits stroll along the white stripes in the middle of the landing strip, their bare feet streaked with the black traces of burnt rubber from the aircraft's tires. They walk to the end of the strip or the beginning of the strip, depending on the direction of the wind. At one end, volleyball nets are strung from iron poles mounted on old truck tires, one net for the women's team and one net for the men. Behind it, past the beginning of the strip, is a large grassy area also used for rugby practice. Kids go in go-karts, cross between the nets, chased by packs of whining dogs, an escaped pig is trailed by its neglig negligent owner. When you look around the strip at 5.30 in the evening, you see a scene that reminds you more than anything else of the activity on the sports field of a regular school, on the airstrip of Tuvalu. Tuvalu is a close-knit community. You see that on the strip. The residents are worried about the damage the world's larger nations are inflicting on the climate. They themselves produce no carbon dioxide whatsoever, but they will pay the price for the rest of the world's consumption. So yes, it's a story about daily life in, uh, I'll show you the photo. <laughs> story about daily life in, uh, in Tuvalu, uh, but it's also a story about sustainability. You know, so a lot of these photos uh, look like daily life, but they have like a hidden or a double message. It's not exactly Dubai International Airport, but it's a lot of fun, because over here you can actually uh, run onto the airstrip and uh, start playing games. Next country I wanted to take you to, and this is a, has a video. Who's ever been to Yangon? Anybody in the back? Yangon, the capital of, uh, of Myanmar. Uh, very lovely place. And this video is a bit about what it's like taking a photograph uh, when you don't have enough time to actually take it. When I go travel, traveling to these capitals, I usually have only like four days in each capital to go there, uh, walk around, find the right place, take a good photo, and then leave again for the next country. So there's always a little bit of stress involved, which you can see uh, happening in this uh, short video. Beautiful light. It's uh, six, quarter past six in the morning. Always a nice time for photos. Fotojournalistiek, dat, dat, daar, dan wordt niet geregisseerd. Want het gaat mij om laten zien hoe mensen echt op die plek leven en wat ze aan het doen zijn. If, if you take a portrait, you know, it's like it's one person and you say, okay, light, I want the light like this, I want this composition. But this is more like documentary or photojournalism and like everything's moving really fast, you know, so it's really, uh, really hard to get it right. But, uh, but when you do, it's, uh, you get a really good shot. So it's usually a lot of waiting, you know, just for the right moment where everything kind of is in the right place. And, uh, and then that, you know, that like microsecond is, uh, is, is that's kind of the magic of photography, you know, when you, when you get it right, a split second, when everything is just perfect. That's like the, the gift. It's a guy with a couple of parrots in a cage. That's like, that's the kind of stuff you wait for, but I don't think I got it. Eerst vind ik dan, vind ik dan die, die, die plek waar, uh, nou, waar in ieder geval de compositie klopt. En ook het licht, maar goed, het is het daglicht, dus dat verandert toch de hele dag. Maar het gaat eigenlijk om, uh, om kijken wat gebeurt er dan op die plek. En uh, dat test ik dan, dus dan maak ik een paar, uh, nou, een paar proeffoto's. En uh, ik kijk een beetje wat er gebeurt zeg maar, tijdens een dag. Zoals voor mij is het elke keer een verrassing welk, welk verhaal of welk thema op die plek uiteindelijk de boventoon gaat, uh, gaat voeren. Een totale verrassing voor mijzelf ook soms. Actually, it's quite good here. A lot of action. And uh, this boat's nice. Well, it's nice. I mean, it's, that boat is the opposite of these boats, you know? Big money. So, uh, and there's like all sorts of people carrying stuff, you know, and jumping off and on the boats. It's nice. And I, I even have a chair. It's just quite comfortable. Dan moet je niet gaan denken dat je dan dat het dan wordt zoals je zoals je het wil. Dus eigenlijk gaat het het gaat eigenlijk vrijwel. Denk je van, uh, ja, 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 dan komt er hier even zo'n uh, zo doet voorbij die het hele beeld blokkeert. Als het echt druk wordt, dan klopt het ineens. 
Ah, dit gaat wel worden. I think I got it, yeah. <laughs> it's a really beautiful shot with like the backlight and a lovely girl with very long hair. Like the sun, uh, it's all the stuff going on. It's really good. She was standing right here, which made it perfect. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. <laughs> no, no. But uh, yeah, so, so a split second, it took me all day waiting there from early morning, and it was just before sunset. Happened a couple of times actually during the project that really like the last photo that I took turned out to be the best one. So uh, don't give up too uh, too quickly. Next, uh, the next trip that we are going to uh, make is uh, I change the I change the order, so it's going to be a bit of a surprise. Uh, that's why, because it's my hometown, Amsterdam, and I thought uh, Amsterdam would be really easy to photograph because you know that's where I live. And I wanted to photograph Amsterdam from uh, from the canals because in the summer there's like all these people that go into the canals with their little boats. So I went on a boat myself to be like amongst all these other boats. And I thought nothing can go wrong here, but um, none of the people in this next video got hurt. <laughs> Dutch music. Nee, thuis is wel Amsterdam, want dat blijft wel wel echt mijn stad. En ik ben er uh, zeker aan het begin van het project. Uh, Nou, was ik misschien per jaar vier weken in Amsterdam en de rest alleen maar aan het reizen. Het fotograferen van de Amsterdam foto bleek, bleek er ook nog wel, uh, wel vrij uh, tricky te zijn. Ik wilde graag de Amsterdam fotograferen vanuit een bootje zelf. En sommige varen dus te hard. Weet je, op die plek kwamen ze ook van alle kanten tegelijk aan en uh, ik lag er eigenlijk te wachten. En ik dacht, nou ja, ja, voordat ik het wist kwam er van links kwam er een, uh, een rondvaartboot aan en van rechts kwam er zo'n partybootje aan uh, en die, nou ja, goed, die ging vol op elkaar in. Holy shit. Nou, het was wel even schrikken. Had ik niet verwacht hier zeg maar dat dat dan hier ook voor je neus uh, kon gebeuren. So, always expect the unexpected. Again, none, none of the people in the boat got hurt. It came a whole lawsuit actually and they used this footage in the lawsuit. So they were very happy I was there. Uh, Who's ever been to uh, Tbilisi? Really? Wow. Like when I ask it in Amsterdam, there's no one <laughs> that actually. It's, it's a bit closer to, the, to, to beautiful Dubai. Uh, also, uh, a, um, a theme throughout the project became uh, animals somehow. I, I went out to photograph people. <laughs> but uh, a lot of photos have animals uh, in the story. And this one um, definitely has an animal in it too. It's a penguin, my favorite animal. I was walking around Tbilisi and I couldn't find the right place because it's a very old city and there's all these little alleyways, you know, and it's not doesn't work work for the composition. And then I bumped into this uh, this uh, city zoo basically, and I walked in and I bumped into this uh, aquarium and I thought it was really nice uh, penguins, you know, who doesn't like them? And uh, all these kids came running up to the penguins, but it was really hard because I wanted to photograph the kids and the penguins, you know, at the same time. But when I when the penguin was there, there weren't any kids. And when the kids were there, there was no penguin because they were like chilling out on the little beach ahead, you know. <laughs> so I was like waiting and waiting and it never really happened. And then finally things started to happen and I, I couldn't really get this, uh, this composition. You guys know about wide angle or like super wide angle. So this looks really big, but actually it's like it's, you know, it's not that big. And does this work? All right. And um, so I had to basically press my camera to the, to the, in, uh, to the glass of the aquarium, and because this, this was um, uh, like a Canon 5D and like the side isn't really straight, it's a bit, you know, bent. So so the camera was a bit wobbly and I couldn't really look through it because of the glass, so I basically started doing hip shots. You probably know what it is, like you don't really know, you never really know what you're going to get. But I could time it because these penguins were swimming around like torpedoes, really hard, I mean, it's like 40 kilometers an hour, so I tried to get it right here with the kids. Anyway, I got the photo, but it wasn't really uh, straight. And I just explained to you, you know, with the thing with the horizon, 
So you have like 194 photos, it's a straight horizon, and the photo of the VC is telling me like this, you know? So I, I decided not to put it into the, into the project. And I thought I'll be back uh, the next day and try again. But with photography, as you know, you really never know what's going to happen the next day, and uh, things probably won't be the same the next day. And it started raining uh, really, really hard in, uh, in Dubai. Uh, no, <laughs> that was yesterday night. <laughs> No, in Tbilisi uh, that night, and Tbilisi is, uh, is on, at the bottom of, of a valley, and it started raining so hard that a mudslide came down from the mountain, and that night it wiped away this whole zoo, that night. And it was a disaster area the next day, so uh, I went there to check it out, and the military was there, and it was like a closed area, it was like seriously a big problem, because a lot of animals actually escaped from the zoo, and they were because they could swim out of their cages suddenly, because there's six meters of mud in here the next morning. And they were walking around the city. So there were like bears walking around the BC. There were lions walking around the BC. Seriously, they attacked people too. It was like scary. There was a hippo, you know, at the gas station, you know, walking around. And they shot it with a dart. And I, of course, thought, you know, thought, you know, like if there's any animal that could survive a mudslide, it's a? That's right, it's a penguin. I was really happy that I had this photo because uh, it turned out to be the last photo of the Tbilisi Zoo, imagine. So I looked at it a, bit, a little bit better and I, I straightened it for like 1% because that was how much it was. Uh, and it was straight. And, and what was so funny about it was when I started looking better, I saw something that was happening during my project. Basically the takeover of the world by mobile phones. Like everywhere I traveled uh, in the world, and I mean everywhere, I've been around like in the top of the Himalayas, you know, in the deserts, in, in, in the rainforests, also in Tbilisi. Everyone these days has, has, has a mobile phone. And the parents don't give the right example, right? Because you can see the, the ladies on the left, you know, I mean, she even has two. That's right. Multitasking, obviously. This is a phone. That thing on the left is a phone. This, this mother is on the phone as well. So what do the kids do? You know, they start taking photos of the penguin, so later on at home they can look at the penguin instead of like looking at the penguin when it's alive in front of you. You know, so I thought it was uh, actually was a funny theme that is also a worldwide theme. And I had to travel onward, but I was still a bit worried about my friend the penguin because I spent four days with these penguins. You know, so you start to like grow a bond. And uh, I traveled on and I started, I, I stayed uh, in touch a li little bit with people there and reading the newspaper. And four days later, I read a, an article in a newspaper, I was in Armenia then, which was about this penguin. Because this penguin was found after the mudslide 600 kilometers downstream, swimming in a river at the border of Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan and Georgia aren't really best friends, so the penguin wasn't allowed to cross the border. And it was picked out of the water with a fishing net and put into another zoo over there. So in the end, dramatic story, but the penguin at least enjoyed six days of freedom. Well, that's pretty good. Staying with the animals, who's ever been to Rome? Not bad, well, a lovely city. Um, yeah, expect the unexpected because I was, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand over here now on purpose. So I was waiting and waiting, and it was like really hot for a Dutch guy. It was like 30 degrees, not so hot for you guys probably. And uh, nothing was happening. I liked, I liked the place. And then out of nowhere, like a guy came on a bicycle, approached, uh, approached me, and he put down his, uh, his bike. And he had something on his, on his shoulder. I couldn't really see like a bag or something. I couldn't really see what it was. And he walked to this fountain over there, and he took it off his shoulder. And he threw this thing into the fountain, you know, and it's like all this noise and screaming and water going everywhere. I'm like, what, what's going on? What is, you know, what's, what's this guy doing? And he took it out again, and he walked towards me, and just in front of my feet, he put down this wet cat, you know? And I really thought it was a dog, because it was on a leash, and it has like one of those like anti-scratching thingies as well. You know, it's like a chihuahua, you know, like something small, no? It was a cat, and the cat also was not amused because, you know, not a cat in the world likes being thrown into water. 
I didn't take a photo of any of this, you know, so that's, I'm, I'm not a really a good news photographer, I think, because I should have taken the photo of the guy throwing in the cat into the fountain. That would have been really nice to have. But I didn't. I was just, you know, looking and standing and like not understanding what this guy was doing. It's because of the cat that I have this photo. Because the cat was like really pissed off, you know, and it started like scratching and hissing, you know, at me. And I had nothing to do with this, right? But this is what made me decide, okay, may, hang on, this is actually a really nice photo. So I took the photo. I'm happy to have it now, but there's a tale to this story. Cat's tale, basically, to this story. Because uh, back then, back in the day when Facebook was still really cool, right? And it was all about having followers on Facebook. I uh, had like 15,000 followers, and I was really proud of it, and I posted every day. And I posted this photo as well. And people lived in Rome and were following the project. They said, you know, ah, Jeroen, is really nice that you were in Rome, and uh, also very nice that you photographed the guy with the cat. Right. What do you mean, the guy with the cat? Yeah, he's really famous in Rome, and you should check him out. Everybody knows him. I'm like, what? I photographed this famous guy with a cat in Rome. Like, I had no idea, right? So I'm on Facebook going like, guy with cat in Rome. There he is, holding the cat in front of the Colosseum, you know, and at the Tra Travi Fountains. I'm like, this guy's with 50,000 followers, right? <laughs> so I'm like, okay, so if it's about followers, which it is in life these days, it's smarter, remember this, to throw your pet into a fountain every day instead of tra traveling to all the countries of the world for seven years. Tip of the day. Where shall we go next? Neuter. Ah, yes. So some photos were really uh, difficult to, uh, to take. Other ones were, uh, were a lot of fun. And you get some crazy ideas just, just to get that one really good photo. So I was in Aschabat in uh, Turkmenistan, and it's not the, the easiest country in the world to photograph because basically they don't allow you to photograph that many places. Of course, I always tried to bend the rules a little bit to get the best photo. And I thought it would be a really good idea to photograph this fun park, you know. But it's like a Disneyland, but then Turkmeni style. Not exactly the same, but still a lot of fun. And there's a short video of what it looks like if you want to photograph kids in a, uh, in a fun park. So I've made it to uh, Aschabat, which is the capital of uh, Turkmenistan. It wasn't easy to get here, but I'm here. It's a, it's a very uh, bizarre and mysterious city. Quite an isolated country. Om een foto te maken daar uh, was ook nog een uitdaging, want dan mag ik ook weer nergens fotograferen. Uiteindelijk hebben we een soort van uh, pretpark gevonden. Het leek me uiteindelijk het leukst om een foto te maken van, van, uh, van in de achtbaan zelf, zeg maar. Dat je dan erin zit en dan kan je dan zo'n... Als je hem als, zeg maar, omdraait, dan kan je terug fotograferen en dan zie je dus al die kindjes die dan uh, helemaal gek worden. Weet je, dat was natuurlijk wel, uh, wel een leuk idee. Dat is dus best wel moeilijk <laughs> op die manier te fotograferen als je met 40, 50 door die bocht gaat. De foto is wel leuk, maar ik heb een aantal regels. En dat is bijvoorbeeld dus die horizon. Dus die horizon is eigenlijk relatief te hoog voor het project. Maar als je bijvoorbeeld gaat kijken naar die, uh, naar die expositie, dan heb je dus in één keer één foto waar je één keer zo... Dus dat, dus dat kon niet. Dus toen heb ik uiteindelijk de foto gekozen van Turkmenistaans volksdans uh, in het parkje. Waar we ook eigenlijk niet mochten zijn. Dus maar niet zo wel mooi gehoord op zich. Yeah, maybe I should have never come up with this concept with the horizon, because it got me into a lot of problems. But uh, I also really like this photo, because it's about traditional way of life. But again, she's on the phone. You know, I just keep recurring this theme. Next, I want to I wanna take you to uh, a country which was a lot harder. Obviously, there were uh, a lot of countries in, in the project that were hard to get into, to start with, uh, but also to photograph. And I wanted to show you uh, what it was like in, uh, in uh, Somalia, in the capital of Mogadishu. Obviously, one of the more dangerous places in the world. Uh, but it's, it's actually a beautiful story, but first uh, have a look what it's, what it's like over there. Hij maakt zijn foto's wereldwijd in mooie, maar ook in zeer gevaarlijke hoofdsteden. Zo staat hij op het punt om naar het oorlogsgebied Irak te gaan. Een land waar gewapende beveiliging zeer noodzakelijk is. Dat was ook nodig in Somalië, waar bloedige aanslagen aan de orde van de dag zijn. 
ben dus geen uh, oorlogsfotograaf, dat is, dat is weer een andere categorie. En dan ben ik nooit echt in de frontlinie geweest. Alhoewel, weet je, je komt er eigenlijk ook weer dichterbij dan je denkt. Want dat komt echt omdat ik het echt belangrijk vind dat die verhalen verteld worden. En ook omdat ik gezegd heb dat ik alle landen ter wereld zou doen. Dus, weet je, dus dan moet je ze ook allemaal doen en niet dan ja, min die vijf, want die zijn dan moeilijk. En ja, die hebben dan geen verhaal in dit project. Ja, maar die heb je wel nodig, die beveiliging, want uh, anders dan, uh, dan gaat het mis. Ja, en hoe betrouwbaar zijn die dan? Weet je wel? Dan zit je, zit je ook nog wel eens mee. In Somalië was het ook maar de vraag, want dat waren allemaal eigenlijk gewoon lokale jongens. Ja, als het echt misgaat, is het inderdaad de vraag uh, wat, ze dan, uh, wat ze dan doen. Of dat je in je eentje in die auto achterblijft of, uh, of dat ze echt uh, je beschermen. Maar ja, dat, weet je, dat weet je niet. Dus op een gegeven moment blijft altijd een, uh, ja, toch een, een mate van risico die, uh, die je moet nemen. Ja, je zit er dan wel, dus het kan eigenlijk op elk moment misgaan. En dan gaat het ook achteraf gaat ook mis. En dan wordt ook letterlijk het hotel waar je zat wordt aangevallen. En het strand dat je hebt gefotografeerd wordt, uh, wordt aangevallen. Ja, die mensen in die jeep uh, zijn omgekomen bij de aanslag op het hotel daarna. Er blijft altijd een, uh, ja, toch een, een mate van risico die, uh, die je moet nemen. Ja, yeah, zo... So, um... In these places there is more than enough negative stuff to talk about, and there are, uh, which is a good thing. There are a lot of journalists there that also cover these stories, a lot of bomb attacks, and uh, a lot of them you don't even hear about. The big ones you still do. Uh, but that was, that's not the project I was working on, like I explained in the beginning. I went to these places to try to photograph the strength of people, right? So. Um, they somehow manage, you know, I mean, you can see all the, all, the, all the damage from the Civil War. They somehow still manage, you know, in their weekend, all of them to go to the beach, you know, and celebrate the weekend. And that also happens, and I really think it deserves attention because it says something about the perseverance of these people. Uh, I photographed this, uh, this beach and uh, it was actually a lot of fun. It's, it's <laughs> I mean, you have to, there are certain rules in a game of football. Right, and if like the the referee has a really big gun, you know, you're probably uh, very likely to not to not break the rules. But um, they're there for protection, obviously. And I I went into this place and uh, had lunch. And not so long after I left, uh, there was an attack on that place, and uh, guys ran out on uh, to the beach and, and started shooting people. So this was also a place that after I'd been there uh, was attacked, which was very, very sad. And it was also in the news a lot, because it was a very, very big attack on, uh, on the beach. This is basically a famous place in Mogadishu. But what the, what, the, what the beauty was about this story, because there is a good side to this story, this sad story, is that immediately people that lived in Mogadishu started a, a Twitter um, action maybe, or like a call to like people living in Mogadishu saying, okay, there was this bomb attack on our beach, everybody come to the beach tomorrow to demonstrate, you know, and thousands and thousands of people went to the beach the next day and, and demonstrated against these attacks. And that is something that you didn't hear in the news about, but it's a really important story to share. And there are a lot of examples in this project of places that you basically only hear bad stuff about. But I went there and I saw many different things that were good about those places. So I think that's a very important message of the Streets of the World project. And I wanted to talk to you about this one. But um, please dive into, into the project a bit better and you will find beautiful stories in places that you would never expect them. After seven years, uh, I, during this project, I really thought this is never going to end. Because when you start a project that, and you have to travel to 195 countries, like it seems like, you know, like when is this ever going to stop? And then seven years later, I ran out of countries. You know, I was like, okay, so then this project is probably over. And, uh, and it was, and we made a beautiful uh, photo book about it, which as a photographer is something that you dream about, right? And it became a really nice book. Very proud about it. But um, it became such a beautiful story that I thought to myself, like, isn't only a photo book, you know, isn't that, is that enough to share this message? And I also realized that the photo book uh, it was a beautiful book, but it was also therefore quite expensive. But like most of the people, let's say like 95 of the people, percent of the people that I photographed in those streets could never afford to buy this book. So I made a project about humanity around the world that would only like 
basically certain rich people could see. So, so in the end, I was kind of disappointed by my own project. So I thought, you know, like, why did I even do this? And I couldn't really figure it out, you know, like, what other way to do this? And I was approached by this guy in Amsterdam, and he worked in the, in the part of the city, which is kind of like a, doesn't have the best reputation. You know, I wouldn't say it's like a ghetto, but it's a, it's a rough neighborhood, and it has like a lot of people from all over the world living there, a lot of nationalities. And he said, you know, I heard about your project, and I really like the story. Why don't you come over to this part of town, you know, and, and share it with these people? So I thought, wow, that's really a good idea. I thought, but where am I going to do it? And he said, well, I have this really dirty, smelly, really gross parking garage for you that you can use. I'm like, OK. Thanks a lot. You know? But I went over to check it out, and it was really a beautiful space. And we started cleaning it, you know, and it was a pretty big cleaning job. And people started to notice that lived in this area, and they came walking up to us, you know, asking, like, you know, basically demanding an explanation, you know. So I remember this really big guy from, uh, from Africa. He walked up to me out of nowhere, you know, and he's like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, uh, you know, okay, I'm, uh, it's like, I'm trying to make a museum out of the parking garage. He's like, uh, what kind of museum is this? It's a museum about the whole world and has photos of all the capitals in the world as well. Does it have a photo of Accra, the capital of Ghana, in it too? Yeah, of course. It's like, that's one of my favorite photos. Then I will come look. So we already had our first customer. You know, and many more people walked in, and actually they started offering their help. So now something really interesting started to happen, right? And it became our volunteers. So we had vo volunteers for this museum you know, that came out of nowhere, and they started helping out. And they were from all over the world themselves and started telling their own stories. And there's this thing in Amsterdam, which called the, it's called the Museum Night. It means, obviously, that at night all the museums are open. But this is like a thing that happens in the center of the town, you know, where all the cool museums are. But they always wanted to have, like, a museum in this part of town, but there's no museum. And they heard about this story, and they, they called me up and they said, well, I heard about this museum, uh, do you want to become part of the Museum Night? I'm like, yeah, sure, okay. So now we were part of this route, and people that were from the center of the city never dare to go out into this ghetto side. Now they thought, it's finally safe, you know? So they came over as well, and it was dark, because this was November. And they walked out, you know, of this bus, you know, and like, are we in the right place? You know, like, run, you know? And there was this really big guy, the guy from Ghana, and they walked up to him and he said, welcome to my museum. And then he started taking them around and started telling his own stories about the world. So it wasn't even about the photos anymore. It, was, it became a place where people could meet that would in normal life probably never have met each other. So there's a, a nice video about that too, uh, the, the Museum of Streets of the World in Amsterdam. My name is Jeroen Svols. I'm a Dutch photojournalist. And in 2009, I started my project Streets of the World for which I traveled to all the capitals of the world to photograph uh, daily street life. In 2016, for the first time, we're doing a really big outside exposition of the project in this uh, really cool uh, parking garage. Maar toen ik hier kwam, wat er allemaal is om te zien. En kijk, het is een museum geworden. En dat vond ik mooi.
So I don't want just to be a photo project, I want to create an environment where you actually live the message of the project. Thanks very much. So yeah, after this we really thought, okay, this is, this is how we should do it. This is the way we should share this project through really big free outside uh, photo exhibitions. So that's basically how we came up with the concept for the Streets of the World Tour, which is coming over to Dubai, because it's the first city that we are organizing this uh, really big exposition in. And I, I was in Rotterdam uh, about a week ago, and it was a, a really, really big ship, and uh, it's, coming to, uh, it's coming to Dubai. So that was the story of a five-year-old runaway. Thank you very much. <laughs> Are there any questions? Don't be shy. Yes, sir. Byproduct of the work, like like the way you explained you've got people with the phones and are other projects that are gonna come out of these. Okay, yeah. So what you're asking is if I did like other projects during this project. Right, yeah. Tough question. Yeah. Uh, no, well, actually it was mostly uh, it sounds like a long time, seven years, but um, I have four days for each capital. And you know, arriving in a place that you don't know and then somehow getting to know the place a little bit, walking around, asking questions to local people, like, where should I go? They most of the time really do not understand what I mean. So they always send me to the wrong places, you know? So when you finally find a place and you still have to wait for that one magical moment, you know, when everything fits, basically takes four days, you know? But in some places, uh, for instance, in the Central African Republic, I had more time, also civil war going on, and I made a whole different uh, reportage about what was happening over there other occasions as well. So there are uh, some byproducts uh, of, uh, of this project. But uh, for me, it's, I, mean, I really have to stay focused on the story uh, to make it a good one. And when you start doing all this other stuff, you know, at the same time, uh, it doesn't really work for me unless you have more time. So definitely a lot of snapshots as well, but um, nothing really serious that, can, that I can comp compare to this, uh, this content. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so, um, how do you decide which one photo is, you know, typical for a country? Um, so, the Streets of the World project is not about countries. It's also not about capitals. I just had to come up with a plan to photograph humanity. I have no idea, how, how do you photograph humanity? So as a photographer, you have to find uh, a concept. And for me, it was, okay, I will go to the best places all the countries in the world have, which would be the capital, mostly, you know, as far as development goes, you know, because it's a positive project. And there I will try to photograph these themes that I talked about. So the project is about the themes in the photos. They just happen to be taken 
in the capitals of all, all the countries of the world. No, there are no landmarks. Almost never something recognizable. That no, because it's not about the country. Yeah, it's not, it, well. Yeah, but there's always, with every photo in the way we present it, it always has uh, a short story as well. So it says which country it is, it says which capital it is, but it also explains why I took this photo, a little bit like what I'm doing now, and what you should look for in the photo, like the message that's in it. So, yeah, so in, the, so in the in the photo book or also in the, in the exhibition that we are, uh, uh, organizing, it's of course it's a photo project, but we do give uh, extra information about the choices I made and why I chose this photo to show that side of humanity. Uh, but some photos, I have to agree, uh, the place where they were taken obviously do have an effect on what you photograph. But they are themes that recur in different places throughout the project as well. So for instance, perseverance in Somalia is also a theme that you would find in the other side of the world in Haiti, for instance, you know, where the same thing is happening with people that have a very hard time. You would recognize that theme happening throughout the world. It's a bit, it's a complicated concept, but it, it works, it works, yeah. Yes? like uh, help financially like traveling to different countries and obviously even hiring like the bodyguards going to Mogadishu or somebody like that somewhere like that then obviously it's going to yeah. cost some money yeah how did I finance it yeah. I mean, uh, did you uh, you know did you fund this trip uh -huh. by yourself or you had outside financial help well the, the, the better it's a good question but the better question would be how am I going to repay yeah. this amount of money that I borrowed basically uh, from an investor. So I tried for three years when I came up with this concept, uh, I tried for three years to find funding like in any way possible. Went to the government, you know, went to like private uh, foundations. I went to uh, multinationals, like I did everything I could to try to enthusiast, uh, make, make people enthusiastic for this project. Uh, most people really liked it or most parties really liked it, but they thought, you know, like five years, you know, this amount of money, mm. you know, He's never coming back, you know, he's just going to take the money and run. So and I understood why people would say no to it. Also, most people wouldn't even be in the same position when I would finally return with this project. So it's very risky. It was quite expensive, you know, for a marketing team from a company, for instance. So I understood why nobody would invest in it, but I still wanted to do it. So I just kept going on and on. And then I finally bumped into like a, basically like an, you could call it like an angel investor, you know. Right who uh, really likes um, to uh, help projects that are uh, good for society, let's put it that way. And he um, funded the whole project. But this is a loan, you know, and it's a, it's a six, six, six percent interest loan. It really adds up, you know, after seven years. So, uh, so yeah, it's going to take a lot of effort to, uh, to repay him, which is what I'm going to do. Um, but he's still really proud of the project, and he, and he really, uh, really loves it. Um, so if you really, you know, the best question to your answer would be like, you know, buy a book, you know, and, uh, and help me yeah, yeah. help me repay this uh, this loan. Yeah. Uh, so your book is available? No. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, uh, <laughs> not so. Sure. Uh, all right. Damn. No. No, it will be. It will be. Yeah, yeah. No, it will. Be. We're bringing we're bringing books to uh, to the exposition in uh, in Alcif. It's going to be in Alcif uh, next to the Dubai Creek. And there, of course, when it's there for two and a half months, it was a long time, uh, we'll be selling books. And there's also a lot of stuff in our web shop. Also, the book I wrote, for instance, uh, can be downloaded. So these are all the adventures that happened during this trip. Fun book. So we have products. And, then, and also, uh, companies can organize nights in Alcif when we are there. Uh, and I will do the lecture and walk them around to the tours. And of course, they will have to pay for it. You know? So that, there are like a lot of ways that you can actually uh, yeah, ref refund something like this. Yeah. No, great. Yeah, yeah, I applaud you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it. Oh wow. So, okay. Now, now everybody's getting. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. You. Yeah. Yeah. 
I just want to ask uh, if all the photos included in the book are shoot candidly, and uh, do you shoot? Uh, do you include two photos at the same t like uh, on one place? Do you include two photos of that place or only one photo of it, each uh, place? Yeah, sorry, I didn't get the first question. Uh, do you shoot uh, all the photos included in, in the book are uh, shoot candidly? Uh, like uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I never directed anything. Which, which is a, which is a good question because there has been uh, there have been some some issues recently about what is allowed you know as far as you are editing your photos. My opinion is, and I was also trained as a photojournalist, very strict rules how far you can go with uh, directing things. Basically, you can't, and also with uh, editing or photoshopping afterwards, which is minimal. And this is the way I was trained, so that's also the way I did it with this project, which is what made it really difficult. Because you know sometimes there's like something in your in your perfect composition, minus this one thing that you could take out, you know, but you can't because of the rules, right? So I never did it, which was very frustrating, and a lot of photos basically didn't work out because you know somebody would just like stand right in front of me at the last moment, like you know, and I it would be frustrating, but I never orchestrated anything or or uh, and also afterwards I never took anything out in Photoshop or edit anything. Because then it's not real anymore, you know. And I think for like a documentary, or I don't know, maybe it's because of my training as a photojournalist. But to me, I I wanted it to be real. And there's always an impact you have to start with because you're you are there, you know. So people, have, I mean, basically they have to walk around you, you know. So you always impact the situation. But I wanted it to be minimal and definitely not tell people to move out of the way or could you like stand over here or nothing like that. It's all full frame as well, so I didn't crop well. Except for the one with the penguin, you know, but I, I was like a really you know, little bit. So, uh, uh, and also, I, uh, your second question, um, I took many photos, as you can see in Burma or Myanmar, I have to say, um, in different locations in some cities, sometimes only in one place. Uh, so I shot a lot, but I always selected only one picture um, uh, for in the project. And that, you know, I never knew which one because it, it was what people were doing in that place that in the end decided for me uh, if it would be part of the project, also because it fit, would fit one of the themes that I thought was important. Thank you, and I'm with you with, uh, without uh, manipulating. Very good, very, very good. Very good to hear. Yeah. Hey, Jeroen. Uh, Hi. My, my question, uh, what was your basic setup for each trip? Basic setup? Yeah. Camera. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> No, I'm sure you know it's the camera. I mean, my camera setup, like, what did I bring? Well, what was in your backpack, for example? What, oh, what yeah, was yeah. Not much. What's the minimal you took? Yeah, not much, because seven years. You know, you're not traveling with five bags. So uh, I knew exactly what I was doing with, uh, with the photography, right? You know, with the same angle. and the So I only brought one body camera and one lens. Also, because if you, if you get to a border of certain countries in the world, and you have like five cameras, you know, they, they're going to know that you are a professional. And then you need like a press visa, right? Which is like impossible to get in some places. So I would just be like a tourist who is like a very keen amateur photographer. Only one camera and one lens, you know, they could like, okay, is he like not a real professional? So he, doesn't, he, can, he can go in as a tourist. And that would be the only thing I use. But that's also why, why I chose um, the 16, 35 millimeter uh, Canon uh, lens because in some cases also for the other question uh, I did decide to make like small other uh, reportage and with a 35 millimeter you could still make a, dec a decent portrait for instance so I would still have options but I always took every photo on, photo on 60 millimeter thank you uh, so oh, yeah. you already mentioned that uh, for the you try to escape the, la the landmarks just to not to, to to tell about the capital but about the people themselves but however how did you get ready for your journeys like how did you choose the places exactly like for example like in Belisi the Belisi zoo is already like you go to the zoo after three days in Belisi we already like uh, roam around all the city so the last place let me think about <laughs> is Belisi uh, how how did you choose this place like did you for the tour like before the traveling to the country or any suggestions from yeah. other sites? Like yeah, so I never really prepared. Sounds weird, but I mean, where are you going to start when it's about a capital, you know? So I always, I did decide in, uh, at the beginning that it was always the center of the capital. So it doesn't make it the area a bit smaller, but the center, the center of Tokyo, 
It's like that's like as big as the whole city of Amsterdam, you know. So it's still kind of a challenge. Uh, but it's really hard. To, I mean, there were only two countries that I beforehand uh, decided where I wanted to go. One was Somalia, because obviously it's, it, you can't just go anywhere in the city, you know. Like it's really dangerous. Uh, and I knew that this beach was a really positive place in in a city that is, you know, very difficult to live in. So that I decided. And also in, in Baghdad, in, uh, in Iraq, um, same thing. I read about, because uh, I do prepare about the country. I want to know about the history, about religion, about, you know, what, what things are happening. But not like with a Google map, because you can't really see it anyway, what it looks like in the streets. So it, it starts working when you're there, but you do want to be prepared, because you will start getting questions from people. You know, and if you're, if you're in the street photographing local people, you know, it's nice that you can answer some questions, you know, and that you know what you're talking about at least a little bit. And I had a lot of conversations with people in the street. So I, th I thought it was also, as a photojournalist, important to prepare. But that was more like common knowledge about the place I was in. But I never, except in those two cases, I never decided beforehand what I was going to photograph. Because it always looks different than you think. The light isn't right, you know, or it's like really crowded at that time. It was really quiet. And so he just started walking around. And I, s I would just ask local people, like people from the hotel, you know, where I was staying, or cab drivers, you know, and explain what I was doing. And then they said, well, you can maybe go to this market or try this square or there's like, a, you know. And I would just go walk around, walk around, walk around. And suddenly you, you walk into a place and you see right away, okay, this could be really cool, you know. And then, and then the waiting game starts. Yeah. Can I just ask you uh, one more question? But have you ever had any doubts, like, where, like, the moment when you, like, really to give up and finish with the project? Or really had, like, a purpose, like, no, I would like to finish with my... Yeah, give up on yeah, give up yeah yeah. No, I never thought about quitting, but I did. I did really think a couple of times like, why did I, why am I making it so difficult, you know, to, with this with this idea. But um, the hardest part actually was, was traveling alone for seven years, which is a really uh, long time. Can get very lonely actually. Uh, but I also realized that I was in a very fortunate position, you know, to be able to do this. You know, and, and also looking at all the people I was photographing all the time, like you're so lucky that you have this chance that it's like giving up is like not an option. You know, you just have to finish it, and uh, I'm happy I did because it came, became a beautiful story. I think. Hi, Jeroen. Uh, hey, hi. <laughs> thank you for this lecture. Uh, I was wondering, you're coming to Dubai with exhibition. Mm -hmm. The capital of Abu Dhabi, uh, of, of, of the UAE, is Abu Dhabi. Mm -hmm. Is there going to be a photo of Dubai in the exhibition? Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Dangerous one. Uh, <coughs> well, uh, em em United Arab Emirates, of course, is, uh, is a country which is in the project. But like you mentioned, Abu Dhabi is in, is in the, the book, it is uh, the photo of, of the Emirates. But I have to say that Dubai is uh, maybe a little bit cooler than, uh, than Abu Dhabi. So that's, of course, why I chose Dubai to be the first uh, capital uh, of the Streets of the World Tour. And also to include uh, Dubai into the project, we are organizing a photo competition, which is really cool for you guys as well. Uh, Canon is giving away some really cool prizes for it. Will be announced uh, soon. I can't really say a lot about it yet. But uh, there's a competition coming up where we are asking people, uh, photographers in Dubai, uh, to take photos of their city uh, in the spirit of this project. So it's called the Soul of Dubai. Uh, connecting, uh, connecting humanity. Yeah. So uh, that's coming up. So basically, the Dubai photo uh, will be there, also as part of the exhibition, printed really big as well. If you win, so uh, keep an eye on the contest, and uh, then there will be a Dubai photo, just not by my hand, but it doesn't really matter, does it? And this will be with HIPAA. This will definitely be with HIPAA. Yeah, 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 yeah. Proud to say, proud to say, yeah, they're organizing it at the streets of the world. So we're very happy about that. Yeah. Thank you. Good to know. <laughs> Hi. Good evening. Hello. Um, when you do this project, um, have you proposed all these 194 countries in one shot, or um, you you choose these countries one by one? And have you missed any countries which you decided to visit for this project? Like, did I miss any countries yes. so far? Yes. Yes. Well, yeah, so in the film it says 194, but after that film was made, I went to Pakistan, which was, became uh, 195. And in my project, uh, there will be eventually in the end 198 uh, countries, countries that I want to include in the project. So I'm not even finished yet, you know. 
but some places are really hard to get into uh, and uh, uh, these three countries because everybody wants to know which countries these are obviously uh, so I still have to go to to Yemen which is a difficult I still have to go to Libya and I still have to go to Equatorial Guinea nobody's really heard about that place maybe but it's uh, well, I'm not really fond of journalists in Equatorial Guinea and I tried in many ways to get in um, none worked and they really know who I am now so uh, kind of have to wait it out to get a visa so I thought you know I came up with this concept myself to travel to all the countries of the world you know and after 195 I kind of couldn't go on anymore and I thought you know but the story that I wanted to photograph is you know already by far in this project so it's not really about all the countries of the world it's about you know the stories that are in the project and they were there so I decided to start sharing the project and uh, one day uh, I will uh, be able to say that they are in there are all 198 of them, but it will take uh, it will take some time, I think. For your, uh, you know, project. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. Yeah. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. First one: What was the most difficult city that you went to? It was like in organizing and in taking the photo. And I have another question, because while I'm traveling, I always think, do you take permission from people to take the photo? Or you just just click the photos and uh, that's it? Just oh, yeah, yeah. Some people, they just uh, angry or something. Yeah. So I face yeah. it always. I, I just yeah. want to, to, to know. <laughs> Me too. It's yeah, it's both good questions. Um, I think the most difficult country to get into was uh, uh, North Korea, which is also in the project. Uh, crazy story what happened uh, when I was there. Uh, I saw someone with a skateboard. thought it was you, right? Surprised to see you come in with a skateboard. I was also surprised in Beijing, preparing for the trip, uh, which you can book with, uh, with the travel agents. And you, uh, you're, you can go as a tourist, again, only with one camera. So I got in. You do have to sign a paper saying that you're not a journalist or a photojournalist, which I did, you know, which wasn't the truth. So it was already a bit scary going in. But I basically was saved by two Americans who were even crazier than I am, you know, because they were skateboarders from the States. And they decided it was a very good idea to go skateboarding on the central square in Pyongyang, you know, in the middle of North Korea. And these guys, you know, so I said, you know, you guys, what's wrong with you? They said, no, what's wrong with you, man? You're traveling to 195 countries. So we became friends, like, instantly. And they actually did it, you know, pulled up with the bus in the square in the middle of, uh, of, of Pyong uh, Pyongyang. And they got their skateboards. One was filming and the other guy it turned out to be like the world champion skateboarding from the States. Very famous. I never heard of him, but very famous. And he, they, they ran out of the bus and they started skateboarding, other guy filming it. So like the minders, you know, like the guys that basically tell you what to do and what not to do. They had to run after these guys to pick them off the, uh, off the square because obviously, you know, that's not really what they want to American skateboarders skateboarding in the center of power, you know, in the middle of North Korea. So, but that was my lucky break. So they were all over there and I could like walk into the street. I was finally by myself. I was able to take uh, quite a nice photo of, uh, of North Korea, which is in the project. So uh, I got lucky there because of the skateboarders, I think. It's a nice story to read as well. And your second question um, was about permission and that's always a tough one. You know, um, it has to do with ethics. In, in Holland, there are quite strict rules, for instance. Um, not in all countries in the world. That would make it really difficult. Uh, it has to do with how far you can think you, uh, you can go with this. Um, so when I start take, taking photographs, I mean, I'm in one place for four days. You know, so you get to know the people that are in front of you. And I talk to them or I explain them, you know, because I have a lot of time in that one place little bit like, you know, is it okay, you know, and if you can't even talk to them because of languages, just point at the camera, like, you know, okay. and they always get it, you know. In the beginning, it's like fun and laughter, and they're behaving like clowns, and it's like all these kids. But, I mean, I have four days, you know, so eventually people will pick up on their daily lives again, and like, wow, he's still here, and like the next day, well, he's, he's back again, you know, like, I start to like it, and when they understand that I'm really serious about it, they actually become kind of proud, you know, and, they, and it becomes a really nice story doesn't always work like that. Some places there are like a lot of people like running around and you can't ask everybody permission. It would never work, you know. So I did get into trouble a couple of times, you know. I mean, people really are very obvious about not being, you know, not wanting to be photographed. You just leave. 
you know, and you respect it, and you go, even if it's the best composition ever, it's their city, you know, it's their street, and you have to find another place where people don't mind that much. So that's uh, that's how I did it. But you have to be like use for me like using a like a telephoto lens, you know, from behind the tree photographing people. You know, it's very different than using a wide angle. And I will be with all these photos, I will be like maybe this close to like the person that's in front of me. So they really know that you're there and you can get away with it, you know. So it's a very very open attitude towards the people that you're photographing. And then 99% of the people uh, actually, you know were fine with it and liked it. Yeah. That's the way to do it, I think. Yeah. Uh, well, so as everybody had a camera in North Korea. You just, I mean, because it was a tourist group. You know, it's a tour group, so you're like, you can be there next week if you want, with a camera. You just have to hand over your phone and your passport, which is really scary. Because like, you don't really exist anymore without a phone and a passport, do you? And they return it to you, hopefully, when you go out five days later. Yeah. And that's well, it's quite the story in North Korea. You should read it. Read the book. Yeah. <laughs> it's all on the website. It's an e-book in English. And that's about it. Yeah. Uh, just one quick question. How did you travel, uh, how did you plan your travel schedule? Did you stay away from home for months in a stretch, or did you break it down? Or Yeah, planning. Yeah. Uh, when I started uh, really planning this trip, and this was so this was like 13 years ago now, I thought, okay, um, it's not smart to go from Amsterdam to Capital, go back, and you know, that would be crazy, right? I wanted to travel the least possible, so I thought, okay, I'm going to con I'm doing continent by continent. I'm going to start the furthest away from home because I kind of figured that after a couple of years it would probably be nicer not to be not to be having to travel that far anymore. So I started all the way in Oceania. Like Tuvalu, for instance, like the first photo I was reading about. Uh, and I would go there, like indeed, uh, for months at a time and travel like short trips from country to country. And then I either was finished in a certain area or I had to go back uh, to Holland to get visa because visa was really uh, a big problem, especially in Africa. Like the, the, the places that basically the places nobody wants to go to are also the hardest ones to give you, to give you a visa. You know? like, uh, Finally, somebody, somebody wants to go, and you're, you're giving them that hard a time, you know, to get a visa. So, and I had to go to Brussels, and it would all be in French, you know. And uh, so I had to travel back and forth uh, to Holland as well uh, to get the visa. So, um, uh, but but slowly but surely, I, I traveled more uh, homewards, basically, which was nice also because of the time difference and, and shorter trips. But because I made that choice it, during these seven years, the whole era of, era of spring happened. So a lot of countries that before were okay to get into suddenly you know, became really difficult. So in that sense, I, it, I also made it harder by traveling or planning it, uh, to travel uh, in this way. And that's also why, why, why some certain countries aren't in there yet. So it was smart, but it was also it had a disadvantage too. Thank you. Welcome. Hola. Thank you very much. It was very inspiring and really, I think what you announced now, the, we, are, we can't wait for the exhibition and people, they cannot wait also for the competition. Yeah. Stay tuned. Thank you very much and see you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks. Okay, guys, we need five minutes of your time for the People's Choice uh, winner in Instagram, and then we will get out and collect our uh, certificates and have also a group photo. Give us yeah. all, only a couple of minutes. You can vote also. I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, people, for the new ones who didn't do that before, we will, uh, we will show you the five winners for one time, and then we will show you the five winners for second time, and in the second time, please raise your hand. Okay? Are you ready? You are our jury today. Okay. 
<laughs> yes. Yes, Urban. Yeah. Now, this is the first one. And he ha now you have to raise your hand if you agree on this one as a winner. Oh my God, one. <laughs> one. Second one. Only one time, please. Be honest. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Can I also? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's halas dust. Yeah, fifth one. Good. <laughs> Number four. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hope you next lecture and please proceed to the reception. Take your certificate and please gather on the other side for the group photo. Thank you. See you.